And we are live. Hello. Isn't it great to be alive, Carrie? It is. It's a great thing. Live so and hi, alive. So <laughs> hi, live and alive. And yes. uh, hello, everybody. And welcome to our video cast podcast. And I have a splendid author here. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. This is Carrie Finneson, uh, who has, since I heard of her, published at least four picture books with more on the way. I've been dying to meet and interview you because I am a fan of your writing, and maybe I will tell you why soon. Um, oh, and I forgot to say, I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books <laughs> Network, who are sponsoring the show. Carrie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's very nice to be here. Eric, I'm really honored. <laughs> so um, I know that usually you like talking about your life from the age of seven. <laughs> but yeah. if you've listened to the show, we start at zero. Oh, okay. Yes, way back. <laughs> but before you do that, yes. we're going to talk about four books of yours today. Okay. Okay. Dozens of Donuts. Yes. Which I love. And then after Dozens of Donuts, we had Don't Hug Doug. That's right. And you have two, book, two new books out this summer. Yes. So this summer, uh, the books I released were uh, Lulu and Zoe, a sister story, uh, which was illustrated by Brittany Jackson. And then Hurry, Little Tortoise, Time for School, uh, which came out in July. And that was illustrated by Erin Cron. Wonderful. And uh, we will talk mostly about the tortoise. Tortoise? Yes. Tortoise. tortoise, yeah. <laughs> is a tortoise or a tortoise? He's a tortoise. She she is a tortoise, actually. But, but, she? but if she didn't know whether she was a turtle or a tortoise, she could be a tortoise. Maybe, yeah. Okay. They're very an, similar. An, an <laughs> idea for a book, I'm writing it down. Okay. Uh, Carrie, so idea. start at the beginning. How did you become such a wonderful, prolific writer? <laughs> starting at zero? Are we starting way back at zero? You can start uh, before I, zero. I do think that, um, you know, any writer, well, not any writer, some people uh, grow up and they're not really readers when they're children, but I certainly was. Um, my parents read to me quite a bit. Um, I still like even have some of the copies of my favorite books from when I was young. Um, so hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> First of all, you already said something really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, Almost Freudian. Uh, you, said, yeah. you said that you were an early reader and then you said your parents read to you because picture books are, are read to us at the beginning. Yes, yes, definitely. So what um, were your favorite books being read read to when you were growing up? Oh, um, like I loved um, Mike Mulligan and his Steam Shovel uh, by Virginia Lee Burton. Um, I really liked... Uh, One Morning in Maine by Robert McCloskey. He also wrote uh, Blueberries for Sal. So, and has like, you know, other books too. So all of his books. And then um, Richard Scarry's books, you know, I had What Do People Do All Day, which I love to like, look at the pictures. I always kind of loved um, books with like intricate little pictures where you could, I don't know, just spend a lot of time looking and seeing what was happening in the illustrations. Um, and then, you know, like, of course, Dr. Seuss, um, my mom tells the story of me where she, she would read the cat in the hat to me. And the minute it got to the part with thing one and thing two, I would like slam the book shut because I was afraid of thing one and thing two and like, didn't really like all the chaos that they caused, but, <laughs> um, so, you know, those books were some of the first books that I read. And then as I was growing older, I really, I read a lot of, um, you know, like Nancy Drew mysteries and sort of series fiction, all the Beverly Cleary books. And um, uh, let's see, I, I really loved this series of books by like Thornton Burgess, who writes books about animals and um, the Betsy Tacey books and like all of Anne of Green Gables, those books. So. I was a big re-reader too, so I would read books like over and over again. Um, That's actually a re-re-re-reader. Yes, a re-re-re-reader. That was me for sure. <laughs> so I would always have like books around the house with like a few of them going, but most of them were probably books that I'd already read one time, you know, before. Um, 
let's see, I loved books about like witches and, you know, just, I don't know, all kinds of things. So. But your books are so soft and cuddly. <laughs> there isn't a witch in a single one of them. No, no, no witches. No witches yet. I'm maybe but, I'll write a book about it. So witch. do you think that your parents, like your parents had something to do with your career if they read to you? Just your mom? Um, both my parents read to me a lot. Um, and I don't know, I think they also they, I remember them reading themselves too, you know, so I think that uh, just sort of emphasized how important it was to read and like that it was a, a fun thing to do. Um, and then, but you know, you could, have I become, I, you could have become an adult writer. Right, right. And I I did think about that for a little while, a very short amount of time, but, um, you know, I think I was like, I was an English major in college, so I always kind of gravitated toward writing as a skill that I, you know, was sort of good at and got like good feedback on from teachers, uh, which is always nice, you know, <laughs> when teachers are telling you, hey, you're pretty good at this, whatever. Um, but for a long time i thought that if if you wanted to be a writer you had to be like a writer like you had to write uh really long weighty novels for adults and and things like that and um i just never saw myself doing that really um or even had any ideas that i thought were interesting enough to kind of try to write um and then so it was really after I had kids. Um, so my my son was born in 2005 and we were reading like tons and tons of um, picture books and uh, magazine. He got, he subscribed to like a couple of little children's magazines um, and things like that. And at that point I was doing, I had been working in educational software actually for a while. Um, but there was a lot of writing in that job. And when I left that job, I was doing that, the writing piece on like a freelance basis. Um, so, he, you know, while he was a baby and then my daughter was born, I was kind of doing this writing sort of freelance and started thinking like, maybe I can, while I'm also writing this this stuff for, you know, for pay, for freelance pay, maybe I could try writing my own projects, you know? Okay, um, let's go back now. Um, I, I'm going to stop you every once in a while because otherwise they don't pay me. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I, they don't pay me anyway, but they say they're going to someday. Um, yeah. So uh, I want to take you back now to my theory, which has been supported and uh, debunked and bunked, uh, which is that we end up writing for the child within us. Mm. So your books are for the four or five-year-old crowd, something like that. Yeah. Um, do you write to your four or five year old Carrie? That's a good question. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think that, um, sometimes I'm writing for myself. Sometimes I'm writing for, um, my kids or kids that I know. Um, I think I probably like my strongest memories are really from, I would say like the eight to 12 year old range, you know, um, maybe going a little older. So I don't know if that means I should be writing like middle grade because, <laughs> um, you know, that's sort of like how I, I feel, you know, a little bit is sort of, uh, you know, around that age. Um, but definitely there's there's things that come up in the books that are like i think emotions that we've that either i've experienced or i know my kids have experienced um sort of in that young age time frame and uh and you had a moment at seven where you became an author i read <laughs> well i did have um so my dad my dad had a typewriter which i loved right always fun to type on a typewriter. This was long before, you know, word processors or anything like that. Um, so, you know, just it's so magical as a kid to like type your words and have them come out and look really official, you know? Um, so I love to sort of type on this typewriter and I would 
write little stories and, you know, just illustrate them right there on the paper and, and stuff like that. So, um, so that was really fun. But we also, um, my mother actually worked in um, IT. So we ended up getting a computer like pretty early on, like I would say 1984, maybe we had a, a like wow. a word processor at home. So, wow. um, so that was pretty early, but I was not like a huge writer as a kid. I didn't spend a lot of time like writing stories for fun. Um, I mean, once in a while, I guess I would, but um, mostly I didn't. Mostly I just, I just read. So, you know. Okay. So take me now on the path from where we left off to becoming a really terrific author. Yeah. So, um, so I started really small. I, my son was subscribing to, I'm trying to see if I have any of them. Um, oh, I do. Hold on one second. Um, my son subscribed, actually my mother-in-law got him a subscription to, um, Baby Bug magazine, um, which is published by uh, the same organization that publishes um, Cricket magazine, which most people know. Um, but in Baby Bug, you know, it's it's very short little um, little rhymes. Oh my gosh, this is actually my poem in here <laughs> from long ago. Um, Why don't you read it to us? Okay. I cute. mean, after all, nobody's right. going to believe that you just opened it. It, uh, no, yeah, I mean that's quite kind of, I think it was because that was where the um subscription card was in the in the magazine, which got ripped out. That's, so just that's what everybody I interview tells me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Oh, it just so happens that I have this poem here that I wrote. Oh, let me read it to you. And I um, wrote it. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so the poem is is called Dressed in Brown. And this was I when did this come out? I don't even know. September 2012. Okay. Um and it it goes, Mama, Mama calls me her little brown mouse. Daddy says, we have a bear in the house. I squeak a mouse squeak and growl like a bear. I'm dressed all in brown, even my hair. <laughs> so, and I specifically remember one day my son was, he was wearing like brown pants and a brown sweatshirt. And he's like, even my hair is brown, you know? And um, so that was just when that sort of idea popped into my head. Um, and so I started trying, like writing these poems for Baby Bug. And um, I thought, I thought it would be really easy. I would just like send off some poems and of course they would publish them, you know? And um, it was not that easy. I had to really work at it, but I was lucky to get a little bit of feedback from the editors, um, which was really nice of them. Um, and revised things and sent, you know, submitted more things. And it probably took like, I would say two or three years to actually get an acceptance just of, you know, a, like a short poem like that. Um, but then when I started getting those acceptances, that was really, you know, pretty gratifying that that was happening. And um, one second, and I have to I have to butt in again. Yeah. And ask you about your writing. Yes. One of the things that um, I really like about your writing is you write in rhyme, mm -hmm. um, which is not that common, uh, but your meter is almost impeccable, which oh, is very, you. which is extremely rare. And um, I have to ask you whether you're a musician, because I tell my students not to write in rhyme unless they are a musical and they yes. can sing their poems. Gotcha. Yes, I am not a musician. Um, I think that I pretty have a pretty good ear. Um, and then actually in high school, I took Latin and we read a lot of Latin, you know, verse and, uh, our teacher made us like scan it. Right. So I kind of already understood about scansion because of that. Uh, little did I know that that would be useful actually <laughs> later. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, and then um, I actually joined. So, so I, when I started writing these little poems for Baby Bug, um, I didn't have any training really in writing poetry. I hadn't been writing poetry before I started writing poetry for children. Um, I didn't really read any books or study anything about it. So I That's didn't know okay. what I was doing. Neither, neither did Dr. Seuss, it's okay. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, 
But then I did join a, a critique group of people who were all like more experienced than I was. And luckily, you know, had the patience to explain to me like what was wrong with what I was doing. Um, and so that was really, really helpful. And, and I think also the thing about being in a, a critique group um, that's always helpful is getting the feedback is helpful, but giving the feedback is equally, if not more helpful. So reading something that somebody else wrote and thinking, okay, well, this doesn't sound quite right. And now I have to explain why it doesn't sound right um, is so powerful in terms of yourself, like learning to recognize the same things in your own work. And I specifically remember moments where I would be like, oh my gosh, this is, sounds wrong. I know this isn't right. But I also know that I did the same thing in my poem that I wrote last week or whatever, you know? So, um, so that was just huge, you know, being in a group like that and, and doing it regularly and getting lots of feedback and, um, you know, just getting feedback from like lots of different people. I think is is really important. So um, I also would say like most people think that picture books should rhyme, probably because they grew up reading like Dr. Seuss or whatever. Picture books do not have to rhyme. Um, if you are going to write in rhyme, it does take a very long time to um, to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard to revise because it, it, ta it takes a long time to write in rhyme. Yes, it takes a long time to and write. It's in much, rhyme. much sweeter if you have the meter. It is. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> Thousands of people are going to listen to this shit. I, I, I want to take that back. <laughs> OK, yeah, <laughs> let's not speak in rhyme. That's that's a no. little weird. <laughs> that gets that gets odd. Um, but anyway, I have a theory, okay. which maybe you can debunk or bunk, whatever, um, that people who write in lot, rhyme um, also really like to do puzzles. So I really wow. like crossword puzzles and I like Sudoku puzzles um, because uh, and it's and I realized at one point it's like kind of the same skill, right? You're trying to figure out a word that would fit in this space and you only have this much space or like what's the number that's going to fit in this line, right? It has to have certain parameters to it. Um, and so, you know, every once in a while I'll ask other people who write in rhyme, you know, do you like puzzles? And <laughs> a lot of them do. I, I'm, go I'm um, going to bunk this because it, it's great. Um, during the corona, I translated a, a children's book from Hebrew into English, uh, and it was in, in meter and rhyme. Uh, and it took me months to do, but I had so much fun because it was, I said, this is like playing Scrabble, but I'm getting paid for it. Yes. It's, it's, it's like a, a puzzle that you have to sort and you have to invent some of the pieces. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Sign we have a new Sign theory on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've so, contributed to the pantheon of, of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I totally agree. Yeah, so that's that's sort of my working hypothesis. Um, but, and that is one of the things that I, I like about it, you know, and sort of why I gravitate toward it is, is that, you know, not only are you telling a story, but you're kind of puzzling it out. You're kind of figuring out like the best words and, and where they should go and stuff like that. So um, the other thing I wanted to say that, uh, that you said in such an erudite fashion. Um, we didn't talk about the religion, denominations. I'm Jewish. I don't know. Carrie Finison. I don't know. It's not a Jewish name. No. <laughs> you could be Jewish, but, you know, you'd be fooling me. But anyway, the, the, uh, the Jews say that we learn most from our students. Yes. So I totally agree with you. I learn more when I'm teaching. Yeah. So the, the critique group is also teaching and also learning. The other thing is you have to be prepared to take advice. Yes, yes. And, and criticism. Right. And that can be hard. And I think that um, that's the other thing that happens over time, right, is you just get better at that. And, and actually, that's one thing that uh, also really benefits you from being in a, a critique group is you see... Well, two things. First of all, 
usually in your critique group, there's a couple people that you, I mean, people always bring up good points, but there's, I find that there's usually a couple people that I like almost always agree with what they're saying about somebody else's writing, right? I'm like, oh yeah, she's right. She's totally right on about like the advice that she's giving to, you know, Jane. So then when it comes to my work, right? And, and that person is giving me advice, it's harder for me to say like, oh, she's, she's dead wrong. She's wrong about me, right? When I already know that she's right, or I agree with what she's saying about almost everybody else, right? So like, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's part of it. And then I think another part of it is um, seeing how other people revise, right? So you get to see how their story started out all the advice that everybody gave them and then how, what they did with it. They took that advice and what was the next draft? What did that look like? You know? Um, and that's really helpful too, because I think a lot of people who are just starting out are very reluctant to make like drastic, significant changes to their work. So you'll see it the next draft and it's like, eh, it's not really that different from, from what they did before. Right. And I think, the power and revision comes, I mean, sometimes, sometimes you really don't need to make significant changes, but usually you really have to, you know, point A is very different from, from point M or wherever you end up in your final draft. Right. Um, so seeing other people like take those risks and make those really significant changes is always makes me feel more brave about <laughs> doing that in my own, in my own work, you know? So let, let me ask you, um, we've spoken about revisions uh, often on the program. Uh, what is your number? Uh, my number is between 50 and 100. Um, yes, what is your well, number? <laughs> Dozens of Donuts, um, which was my debut book, um, I always ask kids in school visits, like, how many times do you think I probably had to revise this story? You know, how many drafts? Uh, <clears throat> so I happen to know the answer on that one which is uh, that one was 89 drafts. Um, that doesn't, not every single one of those drafts was like drastically different because I usually make a new draft every time I open the story for a day to sit down and work on it, you know? So some of them, it might've just been one line that I changed that day, you know? That, that's um, what I meant. I should call them drafts. Yeah, yeah, but- um, 89 drafts. Yeah, so 89 drafts on dozens of donuts. Um, don't Hug Doug probably was up in the 40s somewhere. I mean, I actually with that one, I had started out in a completely different type of story and then I put it away for like almost a year. And then when I took it out again, I just completely revised it, like totally changed the point of view and, and everything. Um, so, and then it kind of came together a little more quickly after that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say most of my books are at least, I don't know, above 20 for sure, you know? So it takes a lot. I mean, it's it's not, um, and, and I think the time is also another piece, right? Like, I don't think I could sit down and write a book and then 20 days later, 20 drafts later, like write a draft a day and then suddenly it's done. It's like the the, the percolating time is also like an important piece of it, you know? So I think every single book that I've published has had a time period of like six months to a year where I didn't touch it, didn't work on it, didn't look at it, you know, and then came back to it and, and did more work. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. And um, you have some sounds in your background. I know. I'm sorry. Like the sound, it sounds like, Sounds like they're monks literally, humming. They're vacuuming yeah. leaves. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds to me like monks humming. Why don't I put on my in a, uh, yeah it, in it's, a cathedral in Belgium? It doesn't sound quite that pleasant to me, but let me put on these headphones and like we can see if that helps like get rid of some of the sound. Okay. Is that I'm any just better? Used to them. Is that better? Yes, that's much better. Oh, okay, good. Yes, they're um it's not that much better. It's it's all it's right. fall. Um, there's tons of leaves around and someone is hosing up leaves over there into a giant truck like a landscaper is. So an sorry. idea for a book. <laughs> yeah. The window's closed so, too. So, so you have your critique group. And yes. um, so I have I have come, I have three critique groups. Actually. No, I have, I have four 
and get a book deal and then go on to have multiple book deals? Um, yes. Well, that is uh, a mystery. (laughs) Um, I think it's just persistence, right? Getting good at something and then being persistent and then being lucky, right? I think those are the three. Yeah, but also having wonderful texts. Um, Having wonderful texts. I think having something that makes it stand out too. Right. So, yeah. so especially for dozens of donuts, um, you know, it's written in rhyme. So that makes it stand out, has the donuts, which is a big hook. Kids love donuts. Who doesn't love donuts? Uh, there's a little bit of math in there. Right. So that helps teachers to be like, oh, yeah, I want to buy this for my classroom. Um, yeah, I think having like those multiple layers um, can be really helpful to just Marketing help your people book. would call them multiple hooks. Yes, right, exactly. So that we don't have to. Yeah. We can call them layers. <laughs> we'll just call them so, layers. But, 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 okay, so I, I agree with you, but how, how what was your journey? How did you find an agent? How did you find Oh, an agent? okay. So uh, you know, it's it's like you always think it's gonna be like this sort of upward slope trajectory, but really it's like this like circular up and down all over crisscross backwards five steps and then back again um so okay in 2013 um i got my first agent just by querying i was querying i started querying probably in january and i think i signed with her in maybe september what slush pile query yes yep yep out of yeah. nowhere pretty much i don't think i hadn't like met her at a conference or anything like that it was just slush pile yes um and she was great she sent out a few things we worked on some things um unfortunately she ended up having to leave for um health reasons so she was kind of on hiatus for like six months and then she left permanently. Um, and so I moved over to a, another agent in the same agency um, and worked with her for a while. And that turned out to be like not the best fit in terms of my writing. I think she she liked my writing a lot, but she also was, was representing a ton of YA. And at that time, YA was like selling really huge, you know? So this was like 2014, 2015. Um, why I was like selling really big at that time. So she, um, she was just really focused on that. So it was just a little hard to get her attention as like a, a picture book writer. So I left that agency and then I kind of like just mm, took a break for like six months. I just wrote, I didn't really try to query. Um, but in the fall of that year, so I think that was 2015, um, I went to the a conference at, that's held in uh, Rutgers, New Jersey, um, which is this, you have to apply to get into the conference. It's like the Rutgers University Council on Children's Literature. And so in the fall, they hold this conference, you have to apply, um, and you get paired with a mentor for the day, right? So this is an agent or an editor or sometimes an author who is there to kind of help you. You have a 45 minute one-on-one meeting with that person um, to talk specifically about your work. You also have a, another meeting with like a group of five writers and five um, agents and editors to talk about industry stuff in general. There's a lunch where you can like sit with them and like pitch things. And um, I think that the, it's you know close to New York, so a ton of agents and editors come. They know that everyone there has actually applied to get in, so they know that they know you have a manuscript that's like pretty saleable, right? So they're interested in in hearing from you, um, and then they all take queries afterwards, right? So I my current agent, who's Linda Epstein, I met her at that conference. She was in my five on five group. I had not heard of her before. I'd never seen her um, online for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I, maybe because she's not open all the time or something. I'm not sure why she wasn't on my list already, but I really liked what she had to say in the meeting. I felt like she 
gave the clearest and most comprehensible answers to the things that people were asking in, the, in our like little five on five meeting group. So I added her to my query list. Um, and so in the meantime, during all of this, I had been submitting manuscripts to, um, like I, I submitted and won the SCBWI uh, work in progress grant, the Barbara Carlin grant, okay, which is like- that's That's incredible. Yeah, so that was really gratifying <laughs> to get that um, because then I felt like, oh my gosh, like I actually do have a manuscript that's like on the right track, you know. Um, and I also won the uh, New England where I live, New England SCBWI gives a grant um, all, every year also. So I, I think it might have even, this might have been the first year of that grant or it might have been the second year. But anyway, I won that as well, the subsequent year. So. So that was very like, you know, these are the little things that you kind of little milestones that you have that like shore you up as a writer and make you think like, even though this is really hard, I am getting somewhere, right? Uh, um, Carrie, uh, these are major milestones. Yeah, yeah, these are, they are, they're, they're big milestones. So <clears throat> when I submitted to Linda, I sent her the manuscript that had won the, the Barbara Carlin grant, right? And she loved it. Um, and so, you know, we had our phone call and, and stuff like that. And then um, started, you know, I sent her a few more stories that I had been working on um, and she liked those as well. So I signed with her, I think at the very end of 2015 or maybe the beginning of 2016. Um, I queried her like December 17th or something like that. Um, so I, I would not recommend that as a general rule of thumb, like probably not the best time to be querying, but um, she is Jewish. So she was like, I'm free, I have plenty of time on my hands. Everybody else was like, I'm on vacation. <laughs> um, but so she responded and then I, you know, I did follow up with some of the other agents uh, that I had submitted to who were, you know, away for Christmas basically. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So I was like, oh, I'm happy with Linda. <laughs> um, but it worked out really well. And she's she's great. She's that, that's, excellent. That, that's hilarious. I'm writing yeah. this down because, uh, <laughs> you know, Carrie's uh, tip number 32. Right. <laughs> Don't query During five days Christmas, before Christmas. You might, I honestly... find, you might find a Jewish agent. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually, I honestly feel like when I did that, I was like, I'm just getting in line they'll read it in January. Like, I just want to get this done. So I feel good over the holidays. You know what I mean? And then, mm -hmm. and then uh, she was like, right on it. So it worked out. It worked out really well. So incredible. Let's uh, <laughs> let's jump ahead to dozens of donuts. Yes. Okay. So, so Linda signed me with that book that won the Barbara Carlin grant. That book never sold. She's we submitted four more books over the course of like a year and a half, none of them sold. So I was getting like kind of discouraged, like ugh, this is just, um, you know, taking a really long time. Like, cause I think once you get that, once you have that moment of like, I have an agent, right? You think this is it. Like I'm gonna be selling tons of manuscripts and I'm gonna get a book published and it's a deal and blah. No. So this is what I mean about the path being like, woo, all over the place, right? So I think I had sent dozens of donuts to her and at one point and she came back after I think maybe the fifth manuscript that we sent out didn't get accepted and she was like, what about that donut book, you know? And I was like, oh, I don't really think of that as like a debut book. I mean, it's so kind of, I don't know, like what's, what is there in that book? You know, like it's just sort of airy and like, what is it? Um, and but right, she really take, 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 no, <laughs> I love it. Take it off the shelf behind you. Oh, I have uh, it right here, yeah. And, and read me read me the rhyme when when the, when, when her belly is gets uh, hollow. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love um, it. She there's a one little girl in a a story time I did a couple of weeks ago was um her parents, she was three years old and her parents said that she now, when she's hungry, she says, my belly is hollow, just like Luann. So uh, Luann is serving donuts to all, and her friends keep showing up at the door, the doorbell rings, 
right? So Topsy shows up at the door and Topsy says, I smelled something good. Can I hang for a while? Luann says, come in, but she's lost her big smile. Delicious, cries Topsy. She gulps down a swallow. Luann's heart feels warm, but her belly feels hollow. <laughs> so um, what, what, a, what a gift you have. <laughs> So I was like, ah, the donut book, whatever, let's just send it out. Um, and she sent it. She sent a round um, to a bunch of editors. We didn't, we heard back from a few like rejections, didn't hear back from a ton more. And I think that was probably in October or September sometime of 2017. Um, and then she sent it on another round. And so in the second round, we got like, three editors who were interested all of a sudden, you know? And so then she went back and told the people in the first round and, um, and some of those were interested because too. Because everybody so, wanted the donuts. Right, right. Because they were like donuts. They wanted to share with Luann. <laughs> yes, yes. They all wanted donuts. Who doesn't like donuts? I mean, it's, you know, hard to miss with donuts. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, we got an offer from Stephanie Pitts at Putnam um, and she really, really wanted it. And so we went with her and, um, you know, she was excited to work on it. And she immediately sent me a long <laughs> marked up uh, manuscript with like tons of, you know, like, I love this story, but here's all the things that I think we should cut. <laughs> from it because honestly the the manuscript i think was almost twice as long as it is right now there were like two refrains in it and it was just way too there was a lot going on um and so she actually cut she was like even before we agreed to sell it she went came back and said i i do want to buy this i'm interested but like i do want i want to cut all this stuff are you okay with that and i was like Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it actually I, I, worked I, much I, better. <laughs> I have to say that I love these touchy feely uh, books, um, you know, and, and um, I have to ask you, um, there, there is something in this uh, book about turning the other cheek. Um, yeah. And um, where does that come from? You know, she's, she's feeding the whole uh, countryside, uh, lots of different animals. There's so many different hooks in that story um, uh, that are going to hibernate. She's feeding them all donuts, and then she runs out of eggs and flour. Yep. Uh, and I'm feeling for her. Yes. It's the dark night of her soul. <laughs> they call that but in screenwriting. <laughs> there is a kind of a Christian thing. I, I'm thinking that um, as a Jewish person, I don't know if, if Luann would, would turn the other cheek in my story. Right. <laughs> Well, she does roar at everyone, right? Yeah, I mean, but, she does get yeah. a little upset. Um, my editor at one point said, this was sort of after it was all done and the book was, you know, in production and stuff. She's like, it's really just, she's really just like the mom who has been serving everybody else and hasn't gotten to like sit down and take a break or do but anything for herself. these aren't her biological children. <laughs> Right, that's true. <laughs> but I thought, oh, I wonder if there's some autobiographical thing going on here in this story. Is there? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I certainly make a lot of food for my kids, and you know, um, sometimes and they bring don't badgers. Uh, don't get to eat them. much myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, they no. They may, may, maybe animals. this is a, a a mom thing. Could be. Could yeah. be. Oh. I mean, I think I think one of the best things about books is people read different things into them, you know, so um, I think people really focus on sort of some people really focus on like the generosity of Luann and like she's feeding all her friends. Some people focus on the apology part, right, where the the other animals kind of apologize for what they did. And then they also like do something to kind of and make they up come for what they did. They come bearing gifts. They come bearing gifts. Yes, exactly. Um, so I think it's lovely. And, and you're talking now about reader response uh, theory, which uh, my uh, hero, uh, Harold Underdown, believes in. Yes. Um, that everybody should read a different story into your story. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move on here because we're so 
getting so deep down into the donuts. Um, and we have forgotten that you have three other books and we're celebrating the two that just came out. So uh, just give me Don't Hug Doug, uh, which is your most successful book in uh, yes. one sentence. And maybe someday we'll talk about hugs. Right. So Don't Hug Doug is um, it's about a little boy named Doug who just doesn't like hugs. Um, and it's not really explained in the book, like why he doesn't particularly like hugs. It's written uh, in the sort of in the second person, like an imperative voice. So the idea is you uh, you just don't hug him because he doesn't really want to be hugged. And that's all there is to it, you know, but it's it's written in a very sort of lighthearted way. So it, I think I hope it doesn't come across as like either scolding or that like, ooh, what's wrong with Doug? Right. Why doesn't he want to hug? It's not it's not like that. It's more like, um, you know, this is fine. It's just his preference. And we need Car to respect Carrie, that. Now, now, now is your chance to come clean. <laughs> do I like Tell hugs? Us who, yes. Do you like hugs? <laughs> um, I do like hugs from certain people. Um, and there's actually a page in the book <laughs> where, and I, I always like to go talk to kids about, about this because at one point Doug says, who here likes hugs? And then there's all these different kinds of answers, right? I do, I don't, never have from certain people sometimes when I'm sad on Tuesdays, right? And so I always talk to kids about this and like, who do they agree with on this page? Do they like hugs all the time? Do they only like them from some people? Things like that. Um, so I know that, so now, you know, I, I do like hugs. I'm, I'm happy to get hugs from quite a few people. Um, I do specifically remember when I was young though, feeling a little shy about hugs from certain people, you know, and just not necessarily, you know, I think feeling overwhelmed by especially adults like coming at you. Sometimes they're, they're like, they're just so big and maybe you don't know them very well. And, and I know my kids also have gone through those um, types of experiences. So I think it's something that um, everyone can relate to at least some in some way. Um. I, I, you're very courageous for writing this book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I didn't think of it as that way at all when I was working on it. I was just like, oh, I haven't seen a book like this. And, you know, one of the things about writing... So um, it, you, you wrote this out of, this was like your own idea or somebody prompted you? Somebody said, Carrie, we need a book about hugs. No, it was my own idea. I mean, I, I participate every year. Um, I don't know if you know Tara Lazar, but she has... Um, this event called Story Storm every year. And so it's in January and for 30 days every day, you just have to write down at least one idea for a story. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the, um, you know, one of the sort of classic like tried and true ways of coming up with a story for me at least is like character who doesn't like something gets that thing or character who loves something can't get that thing right you know what i mean so like there that just creates this inherent tension um and so i don't know how i i don't know why that came into my head i really don't remember um the specific context of it but i feel like i have a lot of story ideas written down that are very similar to that like you know character who likes running can't run for some reason or you know what i mean like just Boy, um ways sad. to get around that conflict yeah so, um, very so interesting. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm also very interested um, in the ideas because uh, when I ask authors and, and um, where did the idea come from? Very often they have trouble remembering exactly where the idea come from, came from. Right. You have this issue that sometimes you can't exactly trace it back. Um, sometimes I do and sometimes Sometimes not. So like, for example, this, this book, Hurry Little Tortoise, Time for School. Wow, what a segue. Um, what a segue, Carrie. You're a pro. <laughs> well, but it, I mean, it has a similar, it has a very similar um, setup, right? It's a tortoise who wants to be fast or thinks she's fast, right? 
there's inherent conflict there. She's not going to be fast. You already know it from the cover of the book. She's not going to like make it to school on time. It's highly unlikely that she's going to do what she wants to do, right? Unless, um, unless, unless, right? Unless everyone else is late or whatever. But um, and then this book, uh, Lulu and Zoe. A sister story i actually very specifically remember the moment when i got the idea for this book because um i was picking my son up at preschool he was probably four and my daughter was in the back seat she was like one one and a half maybe and she was um all she was just a loud baby like she just liked to sing she liked to scream like she just made a lot of noise right and he was like the kind of kid who just wanted quiet, <laughs> especially after like a hard morning at preschool. Like he just wanted to be relaxed in the backseat of the car. You think you had a bad day. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and now I just, I spent all morning at preschool and now I have to sit next to this like loud mouth in the backseat, you know, for, and drive like a mile home. And so he was complaining about how she was always loud. She's always so loud. You know, and I, of course, in my mom voice, I was like, she's not always loud, right? Sometimes she's quiet and sometimes she's loud and sometimes she wants to play with you and sometimes she doesn't want to play with you. And so we kind of made this whole list of like, sometimes sisters are like this, but sometimes sisters are like this, right? Like, and so when we got home, um, I wrote it all down because I was like, oh, this is, this is a story, right? Um, and, and in fact, that sort of structure still remains in the book. Like it starts off, um, the first opening lines are like, sometimes, sometimes Lulu wants to play, but Zoe doesn't not today. Sometimes Zoe hides her book when Lulu only wants to look right. And so it goes through sometimes, sometimes, sometimes um and that because of that one interaction that we had so that's like i love this book everybody run out and buy all of (laughs) his books oh thank you they're brilliant uh and this one we're not going to give it away but it has a wonderful turnaround at the end it does have a little surprise at the end and uh someday you'll tell me how that came to you yeah maybe maybe when we leave everybody and uh, you come back just for a tete-a-tete to summarize yeah. yeah um but and here we have now a few minutes towards the end of our wonderful conversation. Um, the, my only regret is that it's soon over. Yes. But yes. if you can come back next year with your next book. Oh, uh, yes. Let's talk, let's talk about the turtles. The turtles. Okay. I said yeah. that again. There's a book here, the turtles. He doesn't yeah, know see now, and, you, and five years from turtle. now, when that book is published, somebody will be like, how did you get the idea for that? And you'll be like, I don't know. I was like, I don't remember <laughs> how I got it exactly. And you'll say, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good idea though. At my at my age, five years is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this book, um, this book again, like inspired by real life, because I was I feel like uh especially with my daughter, but actually both of my kids are slow in the morning. So I'm always like, hurry, hurry, we've got to hurry, we've got to hurry. And we would always walk to school. So um, and it was like literally it's straight uphill, like it's a complete uphill from where we live the whole entire way. So once we were out the door, like, and walking, it was really hard to go any faster. Like, you're not going to necessarily run up the whole entire hill, right? <laughs> so every time anyone says hurry to this little tortoise in the book, that's really, like, me telling my own kids, hurry, we have to get to school, you know? Um, but... Uh, Can you open it up and, oh, yeah. and show some of the amazing artwork? So yes, oh my gosh, the art. I love the art in here. So this is by, uh, illustrated by Erin Cron, and she has this incredible like woodcut process that she uses that she has, if anybody goes on her Instagram feed or she has a YouTube channel, I think. Um, she also illustrated Something's Wrong by Jory John, and she has a whole video that explains like how she does her illustration process. But she basically, s- draws the pictures and then she carves them out in wood and like stamps inks them and stamps them and so you get these really great um textures um but here's little tortoise and she's she's on her way to school and she's got her helmet 
because she knows she's going to be really fast today. And of course, when you're fast, you have to have a helmet on and she's, she has racing stripes here and she has her lunchbox on her shell and she's taking off to go to school. And the premise of the book is that um, she goes, she starts off kind of over here on the you know far left side of the page and she's plonk a plonk plonk a plonk she's walking along and as the book uh progresses she just moves from that point all the way across to the other side and there's a moment when she actually gets stuck in inside the gutter of the book because she is so slow <laughs> that you can't even see her because she's like in there right <laughs> um but meanwhile she gets passed by all of her classmates like um here's a pangolin that rolls on past bumbada 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 and then a snail on a scooter passes her um and then she gets to school and she ends up rolled over so you know that's bad for tortoises they can't really turn themselves over very easily and then, but then somebody turns her over and it turns out to be her teacher who oh, just no, so happens don't give to be, it away. Oh, don't give okay, it away. I won't, I won't, I won't give no, it away. No. <laughs> we want people Let's just say that her teacher, her book. teacher totally and completely understands that she has a hard time being fast because he similarly has a hard time being fast. So, Wonderful. so that book, you know, I drafted over time and uh, same as all of them. I mean, I don't know how many 40 drafts or something like that it took a long time, but um through lots of revision and critique groups i'm just and... gonna ask you one question about that book there's a lot of non-linear text in that book all kinds of animals crying out in the middle um do you think you can do this now because you are a seasoned writer and you have a wonderful agent and editors listen to you if you were a beginner could you write that text and have people read it well, I mean, I think that um, maybe disjointed is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, I think it has to be it has a lot to do with how you present it in the manuscript and how you think it through. So one thing that I always show kids that I do when I'm writing is um, I make a little book. Right. And so for this book, it was really important to make that little book because I had to be able to figure out exactly how the text would appear on each page and how the little tortoise would move her way across all of the pages so the I editor the editor never saw this yeah. right the editor only ever saw a manuscript presented as you know a usual manuscript i think i probably put the speech bubbles in bold or something like that so they would know that that was supposed to be a speech bubble um or whatever but and then I, I had an illustration note that said at the very beginning that said you know in the story what i envision is that this tortoise is sort of moving all the way across the the spread from left to right slowly and that's as, after, as you turn after page. people tell you not to have art notes and yeah. the bird song was on just a month ago she said you have to have art notes well for something like that you have to have art notes you know i never said the tortoise is the tortoise should be wearing a pink helmet and have, um, you know, stripes on her. Well, the stripes on the shell is in the text, but, you know, I, I never gave art notes about that kind of thing, but about something like, like this idea where, you know, it shows the positioning of the tortoise on the page mm -hmm. across each spread. That was pretty important for the illustrator to know ahead of time. Um, mm -hmm. So that type of art note you would really need to but do. That's at a stage. I mean, usually um, the, people if if people read your submission which i wonder um <laughs> yeah sometimes you never know <laughs> they're not going to see this wonderful dummy book that you, that you created right um, no i didn't I, always, I didn't send this i i i, I will not uh, send a story to anybody without dummying it yeah um so i think it's so helpful brilliant. um so uh, in in just very short because i want to ask you last big question uh what's coming out next year so actually, let's see, I don't think I have a book coming out next year. I do have a couple of books in the works um, that haven't been announced yet, but they are, one is 2024 and one is 2025 at this point. 
Um, I'm going to have to wait two years. I know. To interview you well, again? Well, 2024 one might come out early in 2024. I'm not really sure exactly when that okay, one is. Okay, we can do a pre-interview. But yeah. Um, and but both of those books are um, vehicle oriented. So they're kind of about like construction vehicles and like other types of vehicles. So again, going back be... to your five-year-old. Exactly, exactly. I had, did have this vision of like the Richard Scary, you know, those illustrations with all the trucks and how things are built and stuff like that. That's definitely what I was thinking when I was working on these books. So I'm excited about them. It's, it's going to be cool. One of them, the illustrator is working now and the other one we're just starting to have like editorial meetings about. So, but they're coming. It's exciting. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, and, and very last, are, are there any tips for writers that you haven't, uh, that haven't come up that you want to share? Because a lot of uh, writers are listening. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I mean, I think that people share these kinds of tips a lot, but read a lot, write a lot, join a critique group for sure, find the right critique group for you. Um, you know, you don't want a, a group full of people who are, who basically are like, this is great. You know, you want someone who's gonna give you some criticism and you'll definitely grow that sort of thick skin over time so that you know you can take that. Um, and I would say, and this is something that I often need to like remind myself about is, um, especially if you're writing picture books, don't be too like precious about uh, your work, right? If, if you just try, try rewriting it in a completely different way, you know, and see what happens. Try writing it in just onomatopoeia, right? How would your story, what would your story be if it was just in onomatopoeia? What would it be if it was just in dialogue? What would it be if, you know, if it didn't have any words at all, if all you did was write illustration notes, you know, um, I think thinking about it visually and thinking about it in those different ways, like can maybe break you out of um, sometimes being stuck on something. Um, and and they're, they're picture books, so it's not that long, like that shouldn't take more than, you know, an afternoon to sit down and just try that as an exercise. And it's not really time wasted or anything like that, so. That Absolutely. So, uh, Carrie Finneson, we've been on the air. Can you believe it? For almost an hour. Oh my gosh! Which makes <laughs> you, I don't know, the longest interviewee. Oh no, really? The longest, you're not the longest interviewee, <laughs> unless you're like eight feet tall or something. Um, <laughs> but this is like this is like um, it's like your tortoise story. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go off the air and practice. I'm gonna say tortoise a hundred times. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, Turtis, Turtis, Turtis. Oh, no, I did it again. Um, this has like, been a wonderful interview. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'm just going to tell everybody to run out and buy your splendid books. You've also won a lot of awards for your books, and uh, deservedly so. Um, yes. And um, I want to interview Linda Epstein and, and ask her whether <laughs> that story is tr true. <laughs> it's all true. Um, it's all true. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> I, I guess uh, Carrie's uh, tip that we haven't had anybody say on the show that if your agent is Jewish and you know that they're Jewish, <laughs> right. hurry them on Christmas. <laughs> right, they won't have anything else to do but read your work, that's all. I love it, <laughs> I love it. Carrie Finneson, it was wonderful having you on the show. I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And we're gonna say goodbye to everybody and then we're gonna come back and have a little recap just you and me. Just us. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you for having me. Else. Bye, everyone. My pleasure. <laughs> wow.